Die Sprachübertragung beginnt jetzt. Alle Teilnehmer befinden sich im Zuhörermodus. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar about the Ecotex Portfolio Updates 2019. Let me just start with a few house rules. The webinar will be recorded, which is why you're all muted so that we have a good sound quality. And after the webinar, you will receive a link where you can download the webinar in case you want to listen to it again or share it with colleagues. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions. As you can see, there is a chat function available to you. So please type the questions you may have and send them to us. And we will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. And now allow me to introduce today's speaker, Ben Mead. Ben represents Ecotex in the US. Prior to joining Ecotex, Ben consulted with a variety of brands and industry associations, including textile exchange and a firm with the goal of increasing industry engagement in green chemistry and sustainable textile processing. Ben started his career working for Nike, where he helped develop a restricted substances program and was involved in sustainable materials and water programs. Ben has degrees in chemistry and textile chemistry from North Carolina State University. Today, Ben will review the 2019 updates to the Ecotex guidelines for their testing, certification and labeling programs. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. I'm very happy today to have the chance again to, to present these changes and, and once again also to help keep the Ocotex community uh, prepared really for the ever-changing market expectations. So once again, uh, we're really confident that with the changes that, it, that are introduced that maybe many of you have seen with the press release um, that are introduced for 2019, you can continue to use the Ocotex certifications to help deliver safe and more sustainable products to customers. So. Um, I'll just remind everyone, although uh, if you've joined us today, you're probably already aware the highlights uh, of the updates are available on the OpenX website and are reflected in the standards documents with a version date of January 2019. Um, and those, again, are also available for download on the website. So our, our primary focus today is on the changes uh, for Standard 100. So you'll see the bulk of, of what we're talking about really affects the Standard 100 is that that is the, the most commonly used certification from Ocotex. Um, but we'll also, where it's appropriate, highlight uh, some of the connections to the changes for the same chemicals in, in some of the other Ocotex standards as well. So uh, thanks again for joining us. The, the changes that we're gonna talk about today were really first announced January 2nd, and all of those will automatically go into effect with all the new certifications and the renewals that are starting April 1st. So uh, you, again, you don't have to worry about taking any special actions to incorporate these new changes into your renewal process. Um, and as always, you know, any certificate renewal process can be started up to three months in advance of the expiration date to try and prevent any gap or lapse in certification um, that could affect your customers and your product labeling. So with that, let me see if we can move it forward. We got a little bit of a lag, so we'll try and make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. Uh, so we wanna get get started. We wanna jump right into, I would say, what's the biggest news of the end of last year and what's affected a lot of the communication we're talking about today. And that's the new uh, REACH regulation around CMR substances in, in textiles that was introduced in October. Um, and we know many people are already aware of this because we've gotten several calls and emails wanting to make sure that Ocotex was going to be updating the standards to include those changes. So it's always exciting for people to be anxious to get these updates and this information here that we always try to do in the early part of the year. So, uh, of course, within Ocotex, re regulatory compliance is an important use of the Standard 100. Um, so we're going to highlight how this new regulation affects not only Standard 100, but also the leather standard and then um, trickles down into Eco Passport as well as, as some changes within STEP. Okay, so the new requirements uh, specifically for textiles is coming out of the modification to reach Annex 17. Um, and this modification is known as, as Entry 72 and covers 33 CMR substances. So CMR substances meaning uh, carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic for reproduction uh, hazards. So we'll look 
at what's intended to be covered uh, in the next couple slides as well. So again, the regulation is of course relevant to textile clothing and clothing and accessories. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be talking about it today. Um, there's some examples that are provided here um, that come directly from the regulation. We want to share that, but also know that it's not an exhaustive list, but really examples given by uh, ECHA. And so uh, when the regulation goes into effect November 1st, 2020, um, it will apply to clothing in general, um, unless there are some specific exemptions. And so here we have you know, your most traditional clothing items that are, of course, required to meet the requirements. And then even uh, some of the accessory type clothing um, and articles that we might not normally classify as clothing, but if they're made out of textiles, so including, you know, bags, handbags, straps for watches, um, those also would be covered by the requirements. So again, would be a great uh, application place to start using standard 100 in there. And then uh, finally, even textiles, which are not clothing, but do come into direct contact with the skin under these reasonably foreseeable um, uses um, are covered as well. So that really gets into the home textiles area, some embellishments, uh, even shoes as far as they're, they're made out of textiles, but the leather itself is not, is not covered by the regulation here as well. So there are a few exceptions. Um, here that we know will be in place. So PPE, as there are separate directives, medical products, um, again, separate, re separate regulations that need to be followed for those types of products. And then, as already mentioned, uh, leather itself is not covered with, within this regulation, um, but you'll, you'll see that Okatex is already considering that in some places as well. One of the other things to note out of the regulation is that the proximity to the body is not considered according to, to classes in the regulation. So there's no difference um, whether it's gonna be used directly against the skin um, or not. So that's a little bit of a difference in terms of the way that, that the OCATEX standards are written. Um, the restriction, the CMR restriction here out of reach does not provide a classification for textiles um, or limit values according to the proximity. And so you'll see some of that reflected in, in changes in the, the product class limit values where, where maybe we had the opportunity to have different classes within um, standard 100. Some of those are going to have to be adjusted um, and it really means that the CMR regulation is going to apply to all textiles in the same, in the same way regardless of how they're used. So uh, before we start looking at uh, some of the details of the individual substances where changes have occurred within the standards. I want to highlight um, that the substances included here on the list are already covered um, and in many cases have been covered for many years by the standard 100 and as well as the as other Okatex products. So we're not going to spend time today really talking about those substances which were already covered and no changes were were required in in the standard 100 or other Okatex products, but um, we do just want to highlight that just because we're not talking about them, um, they are still covered if they're in, within the CMR directive here, um, and so that can already be taken care of, and you don't have to worry about those. So what we want to focus on is where we're implementing changes uh, within the Okatex standards as a result of this. So. Uh, in, in the OCATEX standards, there are some amendments that are necessary uh, even to cover some of the products or some of the, the substances which are included within the CMR regulation and were already mentioned in, in some way within, um, within the standard 100 and, and other standards as well. So for, for these four examples, um, just as, as an example there, there are several different cases where the substances were either partly included in the OCATEX requirements or um, limit values needed to be adjusted and, and modifications were necessary really to prepare the certificate holders and certificate users uh, for the implementation in 2020. And so those are the areas that we're going to focus on um, right now. So getting right, right into the limits, this is, I know where everybody's excited to, to talk about or listen to at least. So 
Uh, as it's already mentioned, uh, changes in this section are, are directly in order to demonstrate full compliance to the issued regulation ahead of the phase-in date. So as mentioned, the phase-in date is November 1st, 2020. Um, these, these changes for Ocotex are going to be coming into effect in April 1st, uh, 2019 for us. So, as ECHA makes uh, the disclaimer at the bottom that the list is under constant observation and additions or, or limit value changes are possible at any, any time, uh, OCOTEX also will continue to monitor that. And so if, if it's necessary outside of the normal annual updates that we're talking about like today, um, we also there also is always the potential for OCOTEX to uh, issue a, an uh, update bulletin and keep everybody well informed if there's a necessary change. Um, okay, test methods. So the, the test methods um, are not normally specified in, in these reach restrictions, um, although there is some guidance given. Um, and so even though this is behind the scenes um, and something that most certificate holders are, are not concerning themselves with, it's also something that OCOTEX does review in the process annually uh, to compare already established methods um, and make changes accordingly, or, or in the cases where new substances were added to make sure that the new test methods are gonna be in, accord in accordance uh, with the requirements of, of the regulation here. Um, in, this, in this case, I'm not gonna read the, the whole section. You'll have access to the slides and you'll have access to, to the recording after the presentations, but um, the requirements, again, we just want to emphasize that the requirements to meet the specified limit values go into effect November 1st, 2020. Um, and so with these changes being implemented now for new certificates renewed after April 1st, 2019, OCOTEX is, is preparing you well in advance uh, to be able to use Standard 100 as a, as a tool for, for legislative compliance as usual. So we'll start with uh, the specifics here from aldehyde. Of course, this has been included in the standard 100 for a long time. Uh, the planned target value of the CMR regulation is 75 parts per million, uh, which is probably a familiar number to many people um, in the discussions around uh, where the CMR regulation should be coming up. OCOTEX was often discussed as a reference value. And of course, this is the, the limit value uh, for product class two in the previous in the previous versions of the standard. So uh, what we have in place here um, is a transition period for some of these products, um, for certain products uh, up until 2023. So particularly for jackets, coats, upholstery, um, where there may be a lack of alternatives or there's some other um, benefit particularly around you know, structural protection, flame retardancy, things like that. Um, that's not a permanent exemption, but at least is giving a little bit more time to, to phase in where all, where this limit value is coming lower than people have expected in the past um, and, and changes to uh, alternatives are necessary. So what we see uh, based on the historical data, which we're, we're illustrating a little bit here, um, is that you know, we don't expect a big impact in this change as we move um, toward 75 parts per million for other product classes, um, you know, based on the, the historical testing data. So even with the transition period, as mentioned, uh, that's, that's being allowed by ECHA, we're starting the transition from the OCOTEX side uh, now. So we've implemented a reduction for product class three, really to help support this tradition, so, or transition, sorry. Um, this, so you see in product class three, the limit value in this case is, is changing from 300 parts per million um, down to uh, less than 150 parts per million. So stepwise, we're making our way towards that 75 uh, parts per minute, parts per million limit that will be there. So as the reach transition is coming, uh, that limit value will change again in the future towards that published limit. Um, and we'll continue to utilize the testing data that we have each year to kind of understand and, and help educate around how we're doing and, and places where we see potential uh, for issues as we all work towards that transition together. The next substance, benzene. So benzene was included in Annex 6 in the past uh, with a one part per million limit value. 
Um, and in, in Annex 6, that limit value is, is just going to be slightly changed in the nomenclature there. So it's going to be clearly called out as less than one parts per million. And so that's a labeling change that we'll see highlighted a couple times uh, in the slides today. And it's really just to make sure that it's, it's abundantly clear that the value should be less than that number. And we'll talk about that again at, at the end as well. We have a separate slide on that. Uh, but now because of the legal limit value changes um, within the CMR regulation, we have a limit of less than five parts per million being applied to all product classes within Annex 4. Um, we don't see at this point any effect um, on the requirements of STEP or detox to zero, uh, but when the EcoPassport standard update is published uh, in the near future, we should expect some effect uh, in the limit value there. So here we have uh, some changes re related to the amine salts and the related to colorants. So here with the inclusion of these colorants and specifically calling out these amine salts, uh, we have some substances which were not strictly restricted by name in the past, uh, but really by indirect analysis, they've been, they've been monitored and they've really been covered by OCOTEX um, and the Standard 100 in particular for, for many years. So for 2019, uh, what we're doing is we're adding the names of these substances into Annex 5 and Annex 7. So those are the, the specific tables in the back of the standard where where the, the individual cast numbers and substances within those groups are called out. Um, so they're obviously now covered by the requirements. Uh, testing, as mentioned, has already been covering these under the testing for the azo colorants, and, and it continues to be analyzed with a limit value of 20 parts per million. So uh, under the new legal limits with the CMR regulation, the limit value is, is 30 parts per million, so the standard 100 is, is already covering these new legal requirements. Um, also, as the new substances, or as noted here, the new substances are also added to the MRSL of STEP and detox to zero as well. And so, again, like in the other cases where we have some past testing statistics, we really see a negligible impact to the certification process based on these changes. Um, so, so again, some administrative changes, but maybe not gonna affect people too directly. So quinoline, we have an example of one of the substances where uh, last year Okatex added it as an, an under observation substance. And so uh, what that meant is the substance was tested and reported to companies uh, so that we had a little bit of, of advanced information and we and we had some extra time to prepare um, as pending legislation might be coming. So we've seen that was a pretty good decision last year. We have the, the legislation in place now. So hopefully uh, people that this was affected, they've, they've noted that those results came in on their test results for their certifications last year. Um, in the legislation, there also is a suitable test method um, and you'll see that, that the test method from Okatex that was developed and has been used fits nicely with that suggestion as well. So the, the legal limit uh, value that's now in effect is 50 parts per million. So of course then the under observation status is going to be lifted for 2019 and the same limit value that comes from legislation is going to be applied. So we have a limit value of less than 50 parts, parts per million that's going to be put into place uh, both for annexes four and six, as well as the leather standard. Um, the substance is also reviewed in the MRSL of STEP and detox to zero. And again, we expect that when the latest version of the EcoPassport standard is published, um, that it, there will be a defined uh, limit value there as well in support both of the MRSL limits of STEP and the RSL limits of the standard 100. Um, and what we want to do, uh, what we have here, I guess, basically is, a, is uh, some results, some sa uh, sample results that we've collected under that under observation period. So again, as we as we put it in there and it had no impact on the certifications, it did give us the opportunity to see where we were particularly seeing failures or, or issues 
Um, and you can see in this case that there's clearly a difference between the textile products that we tested here and some of the dye stuff. So um, in these in these cases, you might expect that the dye stuffs that have these these failures, pretty high values above the 50 parts per million limit value, uh, could be higher or lower quality uh, dye stuffs. Um, and so there we have uh, significant risk of a failure that would be affected on the eco-passport side of things. But you do see it translating into some of the textile substances where you have uh, limits either nearly approaching that 50 parts per million limit or, or just over with the two results of 62 and 65 there. So um, as it's now a requirement, it's worth going back and double checking your test results that came from your certifications last year um, and also discussing it with your suppliers just to make sure that they're aware and uh, we don't we won't mention it in every one of these slides but i would say just in general that's a, a good piece of advice is just to make sure that um, you're going back and not only absorbing these changes to the standard 100 and to the other products but also sharing that with your supply chain partners who might not be doing it on their own making sure that they're aware that that you're trying to produce a product to meet the requirements and so you need their help as well okay so after all those words, what's the main takeaway? Uh, really, in, in the beginning with the certifications uh, this year from April 1st, the standard 100 really according to Annex 4 will be totally aligned with the new CMR legislation. So uh, once you get this, then your new renewals or new certifications um, from April 1st on, you should be in a good position there. Um, and even though, as mentioned, that the CMR regulation is not applicable to leather articles, we also have alignment to the regulation with those limit values of the leather standard as well. So um, a little bit of a additional protection there for you guys. Excuse me. All right, so um, that's not the end of it. There are some additional changes outside of the world of the CMR regulation. Um, so we wanna highlight those as well. So these are cases where um, OCA Texas has had the opportunity to take some additional um, decisions on, on their own based on um, feedback, uh, knowledge changes in the industry, whatnot. Um, so our, our class here that's a newly uh, defined substance under the, the SVHC requirements, uh, siloxane. So we have three uh, new substances which are textile relevant under this category and shorthand uh, really referenced as D4, D5, and D6. Um, they've not been previously included in any OCATEC standard, so this is not something um, that was included as an under-observation substance last year, uh, really because they were just added to the SVHC list here in June. Uh, so what we have, um, or what we have here, really, is that the, the these mentioned substances uh, can be textile and leather relevant, particularly in the case of materials. Uh, that are finished um, with silicone coatings or silicone printing, um, even you know the silicone repellency finishes that might be prevalent. Um, and then here you ha you also see the note around the use of one particular substance in the dry cleaning industry, which may not be particularly relevant to your um, to your production case, but it is something to keep aware of here. So uh, I mentioned that we didn't. We did not have this under observation, but in the in this case where we did uh, have a few months here to to gather some testing method testing data once the method itself was done. So um, again, we have some information to share, kind of in some some examples that we that we pulled where the risk might be. We do see uh, quite a few occurrences of detectable amounts. Um, certainly, the the top two there exceeding this limit value of a thousand parts per million um, and then a few samples um, that are that are approaching those limit values as, as well so um, again if you're utilizing um, any of those techniques or you know that there's silicone being used in products it's uh, it's definitely worth a, a conversation with the, with your suppliers or supply partners um, to make sure that they are aware of the requirement under standard 100 now um, and and get their help in, in terms of meeting the the limit values that are in place 
We also have uh, glyphosate, who, which is being added here. So this is a, a key pesticide ingredient, and so it's being added there under the pesticide restrictions, but it is being added as under observation only. Um, so that means in cases where pesticides are a risk and would be tested, so namely in cotton, um, glyphosate will be tested and reported, but it will not have an impact on the certification status for, for 2019. So again, it's going to be for information only, provide a little bit of insight uh, to folks where um, this is potentially in the materials and within the supply chain, because we know that the substance itself um, is, a, is a pretty hot political topic. So um, although the final outcome is not yet determined, uh, for the case of a restriction in the future or what the limit value might be. Um, anytime something is under observation, it, it's a little bit of a signal that we think there's potential uh, that, that either legislation or a restriction within OCOTEX could be coming in the future um, as early as the next year, like we've seen in some of these other cases that were under observation last year and now have been added to the testing requirements. Uh, we don't see relevance for the other standards um, from OCOTEX um, so we're, we're not going to have changes, um, at least at this point, within, within those standards as well. Nitrosamines, again, another case that has not been in um, either the Standard 100 or other OCOTEX standards up until this point. They're included uh, now because they're, they're substances that can be found in rubber, um, elastics, latex, other elastic tapes, things like that. Um, and so again, another another group of substances that are being added under observation. So again, with the same signal that this is something that, that could mean restriction in the future. Um, so something to be, to be looking at right now. This group of substances are already restricted in some other industry lists and, and then within toy directives as well. So um, the positive news out of this is that if, if you have um, a need to, to use, utilize your standard 100 certificate to show compliance to another um, industry list or another customer list, even under that under observation status where it's not going to affect whether or not the product is certified, the testing results will be there and the testing data will be there as well. So hopefully you have an opportunity there um, to use that, that testing report as proof of compliance and, and really to, sh to demonstrate that you're already in, in alignment there and, and potentially reduce some, some duplicate testing. So um, we also, like the, the last case, we don't recognize it really as a relevant topic for the other, um, the other OCOTEX standards. And so um, it's, it's only affecting standard 100 at this point. Um, and then the, the testing method that's going to be utilized is is basically uh, the same as the EN71 Part 12, so coming out of the toy directive as well. <clears throat> so azo dicarboxamide a uh, substance that's also a totally new inclusion for Okatex, never included even under observation in the past. Again, um, a substance that's relevant for certain plastics and foams particularly as a, as a blowing agent for expanding foam. Um, so the substance is listed under the group of other chemical residues. So that's where you'll find it if you're looking for it in the list and um, we'll carry a limit value of 0.1%. So again, that thousand parts per million uh, typical of uh, substances listed as an SVHC. Um, and then likewise, this substance so will be prohibited within the MRSL step and again, is is a is a candidate to look for uh, restrictions when the Eco Passport standard update comes out. Some additional information: um, it's not going to be incorporated into Detox to Zero or to the leather standard. Um, but of course, uh, synthetic leather, leathers could be potentially affected uh, due to the foams. Um, and so those would be covered by standard 100 though. In the early pre-testing, really when the decision was to include it, uh, we saw many of the foams that we tested contain levels higher than that 0.1%. That uh, not only EVA foams, but also saw it within um, 
PVC and polyurethane foams as well. So again, something um, if you're not familiar with it, if it's not something you have testing data on in the past, something to be uh, looking at potentially spot checking or at least looking, uh, discussing with, with your supply chain partners. Dimethyl phthalate, uh, so DMP is being added to the group of phthalates. So again, phthalates as a group have always been restricted. This list uh, continues to grow as, as alternatives and substitutes um, are introduced. Um, and this, again, is going to lead to further alignment with some of the other existing RS, uh, industry RSLs, um, where the standard 100 certification and the test results tend to be used as, as proof of compliance rather than uh, requiring duplicative testing. So the addition of DMP here does not affect the limit value of any of the listed standards. So here, you know, it's affecting all from Annex 4 through Annex 6 leather, EcoPassport, that everything is, is affected here with the phthalates. Um, it's not gonna, the, the inclusion of it is not going to change the limit values here other than where we have this, this minor change with the uh, less than sign to make it a little bit clearer. Uh, but the inclusion of DMP uh, with the whole group of phthalates keeps the, the limit values where they are. Uh, so annex, for Annex 4 of standard 100, that limit value is still sitting at uh, 1,000 parts per million, so the 0.1%. Uh, so the, it's a sum value, so this substance would then just be analyzed with the other substances already tested. Barium and selenium, so we have uh, two new metals that are being added to the list of extractable limit values. So again, these are extractable limits, um, and that's applicable both to standard 100 and the leather standard, um, as well as EcoPassport with, with the new publication. So previously within EcoPassport, um, these two substances were listed, uh, but they were only relevant for colorants. Now in EcoPassport, it's planned to incorporate the, the limit values for these two across all product types. Within standard 100, um, the extractable limit value for barium uh, will be less than 1,000 parts per million for all product classes. And for selenium, it will be uh, extractable limit value again, but this time less than 100 parts per million for all product classes. So uh, we have more and more Standard 100 certificates being used for textile base or plush toys, and so uh, having the standard 100 limit values align with with the EN 71 Part 3 limits is is a good is a good thing, and also having further opportunity to align with some of these other industry um, lists, like a firm mentioned here, um, also is an opportunity to to hopefully make everyone's life a little bit easier. Um, we have no change to the step. Um, or detox to zero MS, MRSL. Um, okay, so uh, MCCP, um, so uh, in the past, Okatex had previously had restricted short chain chlorinated paraffins, so the SCCPs. Uh, now the medium chain links, uh, which is the MCCP, uh, carbon link 14 to 17 are added. Um, and as a result of that, we're changing the, the category name to just to generally be called chlorinated paraffins. The limit value in standard 100 is going to be a sum limit value of both the SCCP and the MCCP. Um, and the limit value is going to be less than 50 parts per million for all product classes across both Annex 4 and Annex 6. So that's for standard 100. Um, up until now, or in the past, so last year's limits, there was a stricter limit for Annex 6, but that's changing with 2019 uh, addition here. So now we have the same limit value, 50 parts per million across all four, Annex, or Annex 4 and Annex 6. In the leather standard, we have a little bit of a different case uh, where the grouping is also changing um, because of SCCP and the MCCP um, being both included, uh, but the limit value situation is a little bit different here. So the SCCP limit is going to be reduced um, from to a sum limit value 50 uh, from 100 parts per million last year. 
Um, and the case with the MCCPs, though, is a little bit different here under leather, uh, where it will be tested and reported, but is going to be under an observation status. So, um, again, meaning that, that there's no failure impact, uh, but in 2019, uh, this is sort of a signal that we could change in the future, and so the result should lead uh, to investigation uh, for improvements where, where we know that there's a replacement for the industry. So we know that these MCCPs um, have been used, the leather industry is actively working to find replacements. And so, um, again, one of the drivers for, for having an under observation status to help identify, help people to identify where it is in their products and where they need to be actively uh, searching for an alternative, uh, but having a transition time in there as well. So uh, to, to further support the limit alignment to the changes in standard 100 and to the leather standard, um, and the fact that the MCCPs actually were already included in STEP, um, we do expect an inclusion within EcoPassport when that standard is published here in the, in the, few, in the next few months, or a few weeks, I should say. Anilin, uh, again, a substance uh, which was uh, a popular topic last year with the changes. Um, it's been on the standard 100 already with a limit value of 100 parts per million. In 2019, the limit value is going to become um, even stricter, so it moves to from 100 parts per million down to less than 20 parts per million uh, for free or cleavable aniline in product class one, um, which is aligned with the other azo means. In, in product class classes two, three, and four, there is a slightly higher limit value of less than 50 parts per million. Uh, to give a little bit more of a of a transition time if necessary, um, and then uh, in Annex Six, if you're if you're having your certification done according to Annex Six in Standard 100, the limit value of 20 parts per million applies across all product classes. Significant changes um, from 100 down to 20 in some cases, but the good news is that across um, the thousands of analysis, analyses that we did last year, um, we've seen very few issues even above these new, even if we compared it to the new 2019 limit values. So um, even though it's a, a popular topic, apparently, at, at least within the standard 100 certificate holders, it's not a, a huge issue for, for a majority of those until we expect the impact to the certification um, to be pretty small. Uh, for the leather standard, there's no real change, only a typing change here as we're adding that less than sign again. So the limit value is actually staying uh, right about the same at, at a, less than 100 parts per million. Um, and also in the leather standard, the limit value is only the free form of aniline, so it's not the cleavable um, portion. Um, we know that the aniline-based dye stuffs are recognized as a recognized need for the leather industry um, and relying on that type of, of azo color. And so um, it's something that is that the, the leather institutes within Okatex are working on, um, also ETAD's involved with, with looking at that and, and looking for options and trying to find alternatives. Um, it also means though that within EcoPassport, where those re where those limit values are existing to support the standard 100, there will likely be an exception rule um, related to some of these other products as well. So be on the lookout for that when the, for when EcoPassport is published. So I want to, to speed up just a little bit. Um, we know there's a lot of topics to cover and a lot of, a lot of numbers and details to go through. Uh, but with the solvent residues, we're aligning the Annex 4 requirements in 2019 uh, with what were the current Annex 6 requirements, so we have a limit value here of 0.05% uh, or less than 0.05%. Um, there is still an exception in place uh, where those, those listed solvents need to be used for technical reason um, or there are lack of alternatives. Um, and then as we see on the next slide, um, the limit values for, for EcoPassport and leather standard are also tightening um, 
in alignment with the standard 100 limit values here as well. So again, this limit value for these solvent residues moving to 0.05%. No changes uh, to step or to either to detox to zero. Flame retardant. So uh, some highlights here. First, though, I want to start with um, the, the general OCOTEX rule around flame retardants is not changing. So any formulation that is a, a flame retardant must be approved through the active chemical uh, products approval process directly with the OCOTEX secretariat. Um, and so that includes uh, a separate application uh, providing tox data. Um, and then review review by the OCOTEX Secretariat. Uh, once that review is completed, then those individual flame retardant formulations have to be approved and, and listed in the approved products list on the OCOTEX website before they can be used in any of the other OCOTEX certifications. So before a flame retardant can be used in a standard 100 certification, it must be approved through the active chemical products uh, approval process. So. For those specifically listed substances where you know testing is is performed um, on, once it's it's approved and it's used in a in a textile or, or leather, the limit values are changing here for these for these specifically listed flame retardants in the back of of the standard. So that limit value is changing. Uh, individual limit value is changing to 10 parts per million, uh, both in Annex Four and in Annex Six. Um, and then also the requirements for the chlorinated paraffins, SCCPs and MCCPs that we talked about uh, just a few slides ago is, is also relevant here. And then what we're also introducing in 2019 is a sum limit value of, of 50 parts per million um, that applies uh, for substance that, that could be used as, as flame retardants. So uh, with all of those changes and all that being said, uh, it's it's most likely only consequential in the case of contamination uh, because of the general rule around flame retardant products being approved in advance and the fact that intentional use of a flame retardant would, would likely require a much uh, much higher concentration um, than these limit values that we're changing from uh, even changing from 100 parts per million down to 10 parts per million again we, we feel like that's um, affecting uh, more likely contamination than direct intentional use. For leather, uh, we have a, a similar change with some minor differences, again, because of the distinction between the SCCPs with limit values and the MCCPs as under observation. So that's, again, carrying over those, those changes that we talked about in their own individual category. Uh, here, the limit value of SCC, SCCP um, only applies, um, and then again, the sum value of all flame retardants is, is introduced for the leather standard as well. Um, and then additional information here on some of the legal requirements of why we're, why we're introducing that individual substance limit value of 10, um, and then the addition of a new substance, a new flame retardant substance that's classified as an SVHC. So that's also uh, incorporated into the list of substances. So uh, as you probably expect, uh, those these FR changes are also going to affect EcoPassport when that update is released in the future. And then one more uh, individual flame retardant. So TCEP, um, the limit value is similar to the others, uh, changing from a, a, here in this case, a thousand parts per million down uh, to 10 parts per million. So we're in, in practice taking the limit value of, of Annex 6 from last year and applying it to all product classes uh, in both Annex 4 and Annex 6, um, as well as the leather standard. So here we have consistent limit value for TCEP across standard 100 and leather, um, which, is, which is aligned with the other FR chemical. Again, we don't see a major impact uh, to the textile certifications. Uh, because it's it's rarely found um, or used in textiles, uh, could be potentially used in, in foams and other plastics as well, though. Okay, so well, we want to talk a little bit um, of some additional changes that are happening with regard to Annex 6. So again, Annex 6 
is the the optional um, that you can opt into. So the Okatex uh, philosophy with Annex 6 when it was introduced a couple of years ago has really been to help companies to identify very small concentrations of substances um, and to try to drive continuous improvement in environmental performance through production and further support of the MRSL work that's done, being done at the facility level and expected through step certification as well. So as a reminder, the Annex 4 is really the, the default certification class uh, for standard 100 and companies wishing to certify according to San Annex 6 limits um, need to opt into that during their application and the renewal process. So if, if um, there are questions in the application um, that you should be familiar with um, or be on the lookout for if you want to start certifying products to Annex 6. If there's questions about that, um, there's some information on the website or of course you can always reach out to your individual institute that's helping you. In 2019, uh, we see two particular classes where we have further reductions to the already lower limits of, of Annex 6. So those two um, that we want to highlight are PFCs. So uh, I think people are pretty, probably pretty familiar with this um, for their association with water and oil repellent technologies. Um, and then also phthalates as softeners in, in plastics. So, for the listed PFCs, um, the limit values are essentially reduced 50% from where they were in 2018. So for the 2019 version of the standard, that means that uh, we have limit values going in as listed here um, of 0 0.025 for the acids, 0 0.0 or 0.25 uh, for some of the alcohols. Um, and those details are listed there for you. For the phthalates, the sum limit remains uh, the same, um, essentially um, 250 parts per million, but the limit values for each of these individual phthalates is reduced to 100 uh, parts per million. So what that means is, for example, um, you could no longer have DHP, for example, with a individual result of 200 parts per million uh, because even though it's under that sum limit value, uh, it exceeds the, the limit value for the single phthalate. So um, again, just trying to, to narrow those, any, any gaps um, that might have existed in the past. We also, as, as the case is, we mentioned some of these before, um, there are some exception rules where uh, limits are generally necessary, but there are some, certain places where they, they can't be applied. So we had an exception rule in 2018 um, for for Annex 6 re related to VOCs and, and glycols for certain product parts and certain applications, um, you know, particularly for these, these buttons that are lacquered or painted or coated. Um, so the exception rule that was in place around these VOCs and glycols uh, was due to expire basically March 31st, so when the new changes went into effect. Um, hopeful that suitable alternatives um, would be available, but that's not the case. So what we're, what we're doing is extending um, that exception rule again. So now um, that same exception rule is, is extended till March 31st, 2020. And then another uh, existing exception rule this time around, the, the solvent residues and applicable both to annexes four and six. Um, so the rule was in place for solvent residues that exceeded 3% um, in the case where further processing would take place. And so the, in the past, this exception rule uh, specified that the processing had to be done in a hot state. And so this is no longer the, the case here. So um, this exception is being clarified really to mean that, that other processes, um, as long as they are successful at reducing that limit, um, are still applicable. Um, and so that you see the, the difference there as well um, between Annex 4 and Annex 6. So in, in Annex 6, that exception rule uh, has to apply in the case of, of products that are exceeding 1.5%, whereas in Annex 4, we can have a result of 3%. So what this means is that that hot, that hot temperature 
or that hot requirement is not necessary. So, for example, um, storage at room temperature would be acceptable um, to reduce that limit value to or that value to an acceptable level. And then we have a few miscellaneous changes as well that we want to highlight, make sure we catch. Um, so as mentioned on several occasions already through the through the presentation, we included a less than sign in places where the limit values uh, were not changing, but we just wanted to make absolutely clear that to meet the requirements, the value needed to be less than that number. So, um, uh, you know, just a few test results that would be questionable in there, but now it's absolutely clear. Um, and then there are also a couple of new exceptions included in the footnotes. So make sure uh, when you're looking uh, through both annexes four and six on each of those parameters, you'll see uh, listings of footnotes and make sure you're, you're paying attention to those as well. Um, so there are a few exceptions, particularly for pH, color fastness, and odor in the case that the, the products will have further wet treatment. So you have some expansion of the, uh, of the, the permitted values in those cases. And there's also um, a new document that's been introduced in 2019. So um, within EcoPassport in the past, there was a standard terms of use document. Um, and now what we've done is that this, this document has been expanded to all the products. And so the terms of use document applies to all products and really defines the legal relationship be between Okatex and the customer, the company that's filling out the application. Um, and so that document must be acknowledged in the application process. So you'll find a question checkbox in there in the application where you have to acknowledge that. That full document is available on the Okatex website um, or um, you, you can of course get it from your um, local institute that you're working with if you want a copy of it. And I've, I've teased a little bit um, as we've gone through here um, that the new Eco Passport standard is, is not yet published and available. This is coming soon. Um, and it is still planned to go into effect uh, with new certifications and renewals starting April 1st. Um, and, and so there are um, some distinct differences to, to textile chemicals and, and those needed for leather processing. Um, so in addition to the, the new version coming, um, there also is a um, Eco Passport version specifically for leather chemicals that's planned and, and coming in the future. So uh, be aware of, of that in the future, and hopefully that helps uh, with some of these changes that have been incorporated into the leather standard as well. And then just a few highlights, um, not to take up too much time, but just to talk about step as the facility level certification offered by Okatex here. Um, so there are some changes to both the step standard and the assessment. The new standard documents are available now on the Okatex website. And, and those changes that are happening and, and really highlighted here, both in the standard itself, um, so what the, re the requirements and the rules are, but also in the assessment questions, which is what the facility would fill out as they're working through to try and get certification. Uh, both of those are automatically going to be taken into effect um, now with new certifications that are, that are starting. And then companies that have certifications already in place, um, uh, th those will be implemented really as appropriate uh, by the Institute when, as they go through sort of updating assessments or at least through their renewal process and through the ongoing compliance audit being processed. So if you are also certified to standard to, to step, um, it's, it's uh, worthwhile to take a look at those documents um, and, and make sure that any of the changes that have been implemented, um, that you're well aware of those and that you can consider those for your renewal process as well. Um, another change is that the step standard, which has really been focused on on textile processing, is being extended to be applicable to leather processing applications as well. So uh, with a creative solution, the acronym step is not changing, uh, but the official name is changing from sustainable textile production standard to sustainable textile and leather production standard. So leather production uh, facilities wanting step 
uh, would specify leather operations in the initial application process where you identify what are the what are the products processes um, and some other details around your facility you, you you specify that at the very beginning and then during the assessment process that designation as, as leather processing operations triggers the leather specific questions with within that assessment portal so um, those questions in that in that smart portal um, really are tailored to your specific operation so uh, now it's it's possible for uh, the leather for leather processing facilities to uh, to work through that process as well all right so um, with that we're really closing the the highlights that we wanted to share closing the presentation today um, we are doing the presentations or they've done it this morning already in German this one in English we'll do it uh, for the colleagues in Chinese later to tomorrow um, and so I know that there are submitted questions coming in from from all of those those presentations and so uh, the Okatex colleagues will be gathering those together and we'll be distributing them out with with answers to there but I'll turn it back over to Christina and see if there are any questions that came in that we should answer directly right now. Yes, thank you so much, Ben, for this um, presentation. And we've received a couple of questions. I'm not sure we will be able to answer all of them today, but as you said, the questions that we can't answer, we will answer in a in an email later. So the first questions that we the first question that we have is, what is quinoline used for? And what's the reason for finding it in dispersed dyes? So it, it is going to be similar to the other uh, dye stuff. So that's the reason for, for finding it there. It's part of those building blocks of uh, those particular dye stuffs. And so that's, those are the, the types of products. So any, any product that would be dyed uh, with dispersed dye stuffs as well would continue to be analyzed for for those colorants, those restricted colorants, and, and quinoline would be added into that group as well. Okay, um, the second question we have is regarding new textile annex 17 restriction, chloroorganic carriers and carcinogenic dyes were already in standard 100 and so commonly tested. What's the detection statistics for those requirements? Yeah, so that I don't have those in front of me. I th like you mentioned, they are tested, so that may be something that we can uh, pull up from the different institutes. And so that's when I'm going to just defer a little bit and see if we can uh, regroup with the colleagues and if that's something that we can we can provide in a similar way. Because uh, I assume that the the question is to highlight, okay, what's the risk to um, as this being a, a, a legal requirement added. Okay, and one last question. Um, isn't it a con contradiction for Ecotex fabric and Eco Passport product to have the same limit value for siloxane? Um, yeah, I mean, that's one where I'm not as familiar with what is happening or what's going to happen exactly with the siloxane. So again, I think that's one that maybe we, we table and follow up on um, to figure out what's the the reasoning uh, coming from the technical committees on on why those limit values were put where they are, so I think it's going to be better for for somebody else to be able to answer that um, rather than me off the cuff. Okay, great. I guess that's it for today. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for listening in. Um, as I mentioned before, we will send a link to the recording in case you'd like to share the information with your colleagues or if you would like to listen to it again. And yeah, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any more questions. And we're looking forward to hearing you at our next webinar. So from my side, goodbye and have a good day.